also the Boonwurrung and Woiwurrung, um, traditional custodians of the land on which my home campus, Footscray Park, Footscray Nicholson um, sit, and pay respects to their elders, past, present. And I extend that respect um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, now good. So this is the second seminar in a series hosted by the Community Identity Displacement Research Network. And part of our focus for this year was sort of inspired by this uh, unsettled times that we, um, we're living, living through. So today we have um, uh, the pleasure of learning with uh, Dr. Pilar Kassat, um, a friend and long-term collaborator based over in the, the east of Melbourne. Uh, no, in Western Australia. So that's, yeah, well, very west of Melbourne, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just a, just a little bit about uh, Pilar. So I'll go through, just to share a bit with, uh, about her through her bio. So Pilar is a Chilean Australian living in the ancient country of the Wajuk Noongar people, um, Perth, Western Australia. She is a respected senior cultural executive, advocate and community development practitioner. She's led artistic operation and operational excellence with a proven track record of creative engagement and intercultural dialogue with First Nations and people of color within a social justice framework. Um, Pilar is a fellow of um, Leadership Western Australia. She recently completed her PhD and she also has a master's um, of sustainability and social change. And she, has, and she leads in the not-for-profit sector. Um, she's chairperson of the Arts on the Move and Women of Colour Australia, and previously deputy chair of Diversity Arts Australia. Um, and she has served on several boards, including the Chamber of Commerce um, and Culture in WA for about six years. So Pilar has presented at uh, lots of conferences, including those with us. Um, we've dragged her um, into community psychology <laughs> against her better judgment, of course, but, um, and her work uh, on, her, on her work in the arts um, and how arts plays this role in social change. Um, and Pilar has also been a co-author with um, Amy Quayle and myself and, and, and others. Um, working transdisciplinary and also across practices. So today we've got the great fortune of hearing Pilar speak about her thesis um, uh, work, um, which is titled, Nobody Gets to Rewrite These Things. These are my histories, epistemologies of women of color in art for social change. Um, so just before we start, so Pilar is going to present for maybe about um, uh, 40, 45 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. if people have questions or comments, they can pop them in the in the chat and we'll revisit some of those as, as they come up. Um, and if you don't mind, we're going to record this because we're sort of developing an archive of the of the talks while we can before we actually get out of the, the Zoom phase um, in a couple <laughs> in a couple of months. So over to you, Pilar. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning to everyone. And um, thank you so much for taking an interest in my research. Um, special thanks to you, Chris. I, as you said, we go back a long way. It's almost 20 years, actually, um, of, of um, friendship and collaborations. Um, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Nyunga Nation as the traditional owners of the land in which I live and work. And I pay my respects to the eldest, past, present, future, and their children and families. The motivation behind my research has been uh, to really articulate the potential of art for social change as a decolonizing practice for women and in particular for women of color and indigenous women. This desire stems from my lived experience of community arts and its role in helping, to, in helping me actually to make sense of my reality after arriving in Australia as a political refugee from Chile in the late, in the late 1980s. And also after 11 years of CEO of the Community Arts Network here in, in Western Australia, where I experienced firsthand the potential of this practice, um, uh, uh, its liberation and emancipatory um, potential. I present this image to you, the goddess of dignity, as my first image, as a bit of a provocation. Um, this image for me uh, is a huge transgression of the place and spaces that women occupy in, uh, in our society. Uh, this image uh, was um, taken in Santiago, uh, my birthplace uh, of Chile in 2020 for International Women's Day. 
Uh, the woman that you see here, Andrea Olivares, um, she is a dancer whose mother and grandmother were um, tortured during the Pinochet regime. Uh, as a result, Andrea has lived most of her life in the UK, but, but she was in Chile at this time. Um, in March 2020, uh, there's been several months of huge, a huge social uprising in Chile as a result of the huge inequalities that exist there. In fact, um, Chile is one of the most unequal OECD countries uh, with a huge gap between the rich and the poor. So, um, so Andrea was in Santiago, uh, International Women's Day. This particular in 2020 was the largest march ever witnessed in, in the globe for International Women's Day where about 2 million women or mostly women attended this march. In a city where you have six million people, you can imagine two million people as a lot. That's a lot of people. Um, so, uh, for her to get to where this um, monument, this monument is in the very central Plaza Vaquedano, uh, it is uh, an honor to um, a, one of the most condecorated generals um, in, in Chile. It's been there, this monument, for about 100 years. And it's a, it's a huge uh, monument. The plinks in which the, um, this horse is mounted, it's probably about eight meters high. So for her to get up there would have taken a huge amount of effort. And you can see, right, you can see her body, her legs, hugely strong woman. So um, uh, making, and for me, uh, this is part of making women's stories visible because this is the key to feminist decolonial practice. Um, so Manuel Vaquedano, this general, uh, uh, he, he was instrumental in the occupation of Mapuche territory. And when you see on the bottom left of your screen is uh, the Mapuche flag. Um, now, I will come back to talk a little bit more about this, uh, but for now, uh, I, will, I will leave it as that. Now, I'm, I really need to frame my research by telling you a little bit about myself. So telling my own story is the way to decolonize my subjectivity, which is really important for my scholarly work, but also for my soul. Revisiting old memories uh, may seem somewhat indulgent for some, but when those memories, particularly from childhood, are understood against a web of deliberate systemic oppressions, they transform into powerful a tool, they become stories. As a woman of color, political refugee and a community cultural development practitioner, my stories carry vivid experiences and emotions that have helped me to affirm a political voice from which to speak. Stories hold personal and collective power and have capacity to cut through and subvert the establishment. As my friend and colleague, um, Veronica Pardo, who is actually a CEO of Multicultural Arts Victoria says, and this is insp inspiration for my talk today. Th she says, these are my stories. This is my life. This is what happened to me. Nobody gets to rewrite these things. In making this declaration, Veronica validates and affirms her own experiences. And more importantly, she asserts the principle of self-determination. In this spirit, I present fragments of my own story and the stories of other women throughout this work. In the middle here, um, you've got me as a baby with my grandmother, Clara Luz, uh, uh, Clara Luz <laughs> de Pulvera Garcia. Uh, and on the other side, you've got uh, my great-grandmother, uh, Rosa Munizaga. Um, Rosa Munizaga, who you see on the left of your screen, she, um, I only learned some of this stuff very recently. Uh, Rosa was an incredible midwife, um, apparently a really uh, well sought after, obviously not medically trained, uh, but people used to come and knock on the door in the middle of the night uh, for her to come and help deliver babies. She never charged for what she did. And also apparently she was an incredible, um, had incredible capacity to pull people's bones back in place. Uh, my mom told me uh, just the other day that once she saw a guy coming in with a jaw, you know, who was dislocated, I think he'd been on a fight or something and 
my grandma, who is very small, she managed to put his jaw back in place. Um, now, my, my grandma in the middle there, um, she was um, incredible, strong, very stern. She wasn't the cuddly kind of grandma. <laughs> She was. Uh, she commanded respect. She sat at the head. She sat, you know, at the head of the table, and um, she was very loud and quite, you know. She. I was a bit scared of her. She. Um, before winter, she would make this concoction of um, onion, garlic, and lemon juice and honey, and she boiled this, to make it into a syrupy kind of thing. And um, she used to line us up, you know, all the grandkids and shove this thing in our mouths just before winter time. She uh, never saw a doctor. She had no time for needles. She thought that was an aberration uh, till the day she died. She died at home. And um, she, I used to see her washing her hair with this uh, root of a tree called Kijai. Um, why I'm saying this, you'll, I'll reveal you in a moment, but the, the other woman that, um, on the right of your screen, is a, an unknown uh, Mapuche woman. Mapuche are the First Nations uh, people of the south of Chile. I saw this photograph. Actually, this photograph stopped me on my tracks. I was, um, the last time I went to Chile was in 2019, and I went to Patagonia with my family. We were, in, this is a little town, and we were in a museum there. And when I saw this photo, I, um, even telling you now, I get, was bumpy because when I saw this photo, I just, I was, I froze. Why I froze is because I could, I saw my grandmother in that photograph, right? Um, as you can see, there is an obvious resemblance between my grandmother and this unknown Mapuche woman. But for me, there was something else. It was about the body posture and all the eyes. There was something quite striking. Now, my grandmother would be horrified she would be embarrassed she would be angry with me if I um because I'm putting these two images side by side because she never absolutely ever had um she she only claimed her Spanish ancestry she she would despise to be associated with an indigenous woman so when I saw this photo for me I, I, I don't know I've been kind of digging my PhD and all of a sudden I just had so many questions because of course you know there was only we revered our European heritage heritage um, on my father's side I've got German German heritage and we knew a lot about that but never in fact I don't know anything about um, very little about my great grandmothers on my on my grandmother's side on this grandmother's side so I cannot claim I cannot claim at all Indigenous heritage because actually I don't know. But what I can tell you is that I feel robbed of the opportunity to do so and how my life might have turned up if I knew uh, what my heritage on my mother's side was. Um, soon after arriving in Perth, I became involved in community arts. It became a way of connecting with others and making sense of my reality as a Chilean in exile. These are contested practices known by different names, such as community, cultural development, participatory arts, or art for social change. But they all have in common uh, that they use different modalities of art, such as visual, verbal, written, and performance for working with and in communities. They've been associated with social justice and empowerment of communities. In the global north, uh, they emerge as an alternative to elite arts and alongside uh, social movements. And this happened around the 1960s and 70s, uh, where um, they grew alongside other really important social movements, such as feminism, civil and land rights, Aboriginal land rights, in particular here in Australia. They become a vehicle for engaging in creative ways with the ideals of empowerment and emancipation. Uh, in the 1990s, though, uh, they were widely adopted into state funding streams, and some scholars argue that because of this reason, they lost their political imperative. In the global south, community arts has been strongly linked to emancipatory struggles. In Abiyayala, 
or Latin America, this practice became very dangerous during the dictatorship regimes that plagued the continent in those 30 years between the 1960s and 1990s. Many, many countries in Latin America experienced dictatorship and Chile was one of them. Uh, uh, by the way, I use the term global south and north, uh, not so much as a geographical uh, difference, but much more to refer to the ongoing power inequality that exists um, within and between countries. So many artists during this time were exiled or murdered and um, that happened across the continent. When, when I looked at the theories of, um, of the, the, if you like, the philosophical underpinnings of this practice, uh, both in the global south and north, there, was, there were two names that kept recurring on this. And one is Paulo Freire with this seminal work of uh, Pedagogy of the Oppress. Um, he actually wrote this uh, while he was exiled in Chile from Brazil in the, you know, during Agenda um, regime of the Agenda uh, presidency. And the other name is um, Augusto Boal, who is a disciple of Freire uh, with his work of um, Theatre of the Oppressed. And they're both really cited as key influences on this practice. And so my research began with a desire as a non-Indigenous woman to make sense of the complex and contested terrain working with First Nations people in arts and culture. It began with my own personal reflections on arts and social change, as I was saying earlier, as having been, I had direct involvement in community arts, both as a practitioner as an art, and an art executive. But soon it became a much deeper exploration on how to decolonize my own subjectivity, supported by feminist theories from the global south. This is how I set out to critically understand the relationship between community arts, and collaborative arts practices and the empowerment of women, especially those women who have been impacted by the legacies of colonial rule. Ophelia Schutt, uh, she's a Cuban scholar, here suggests that feminist and cultural work has to account for women who have been silenced and invisibilized. This statement really actually challenges the narrow standpoint of Western feminism which I have failed to account for the intersecting nature of gender and development issues faced by women of color and indigenous women. Uh, there's three quotes um, that you can see on the screen there from very important Southern feminist frame the which and in which I began thinking about artificial change as an empowering process and how I developed the research methods. Linda Tohiwai Smith asks us to look and to find, to look for and to find our histories and stories. She invites us to discover self-reflexive practices and methods. Chanda Talpade Mohanty asks us to pay attention to the specificities of each context in order to understand how these singularities connect to global systems of oppression. Hence, uh, I use qualitative case studies that allow for experiential knowledge to be accounted for. And Gloria Dalsua teaches us about the importance of gaining consciousness and awareness and to find different ways to look at and understand our subjective positions. The dark skinned woman has been silenced, gagged, caged, bound into servitude. She has been a slave, a force of cheap labor colonized by the Spaniards, the Anglo, by her own people. The spirit of the fire spurs her to fight for her own skin and a piece of ground to stand on, a ground from which to view the world, a perspective. She waits. Aquí en la soledad prospera su rebeldía. Here in solitude, her rebelliousness prospers. The work that I'm presenting today is based on several case studies. Two are based in Australia, which is my current home, and two are based in Chile. Chile was the birthplace and training ground for global neoliberal policies during the Pinochet regime. Also, both countries are settler colonial societies, and the states have systematically and continually inflicted violence on women 
especially on women of color and indigenous women through entrenched patriarchal systems of oppression and power and the ongoing legacies of colonization. Across the case studies and through conversational interviews with women who were involved in actual social change as um, participants or artists and, and arts workers, I gained many insights um, into the way in which women conceptualize art for social change. Case one examines and reflects the practice of art for social change uh, when I was the CEO of the Community Arts Network between the years of 2005 and 2015. Where there were many ongoing programs with Nyunga people on Nyunga country. And the focus of this was the retrieval and reclamation of cultural knowledges through long term a long term project uh, of minimal about three years. The case study two explore the experiences and reflections of three women of color who are leaders um, in art for social change here in Australia. And this chapter links to different um, poetry writing projects with Afghan, Afghan women, one in Western Sydney and the other was a US led project with women in Afghanistan within the context of the global war on terror. Case three investigates the experiences of women who are involved in a residential theater uh, popular festival in, in, in Santiago, where it, this happens in very poor neighborhoods um, in the outskirts of the capital city. And the festival has been in incredible ways, been ongoing for 30 years with minimal state support, almost null, nil. Uh, the last um, case study, uh, uh, studies two different movements. One is the Arpillera movement, uh, post agenda and Las Tesis feminist response to the social uprising in Chile in October 2019, which they thought at the beginning was related to that. So I will briefly speak to you about um, some of the case, some of the elements of the case studies, and in particular two, which is one and four. In the Yans of the Heart, uh, the Young Adult Making Project, the women work with two textile artists, Analda Searles and Cecile Williams. And each doll narrated personal stories. Many women remember their nanas making dolls. And so they began expressing collective memories, such as the forcible removal of children from their families. The dolls then become a symbol and a vehicle of retrieval and reclamation for the stolen generations. Some of the women also spoke about their pain at losing loved ones to suicide, also about drug and alcohol addiction. But equally, they spoke about how they were rethinking their place in the world. For example, Nolin Oldman called her doll Freedom Doll because she reflected on their grandparents' restrictions of movement and the humiliation they experienced when coming into town. Her Freedom Doll. Um, Contrary to that, just goes and does what she wants. Um, she says, I put her in blue, bright blue and yellow. She's letting her freedom out. Nola Williams uh, created a doll called Jandamara, who represents the strength of the Nyunga people. And she says, a lot of people think they're weak, but I thought this little doll would give me strength to fight battles. It reminds me of a strong leader like Yagan. Some of the women and their dolls traveled to Sydney as picture here. Their work was exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Sydney as part of a, a large exhibition called Strength Theory, which toured um, Australia for three years. When we embark on this project, we have absolutely no idea uh, that the women be, would become exhibited artists and that their dolls and their stories would travel so wide and far. Uh, one of the doll makers, Mar Marcel Riley, who has been, uh, who was involved in the project, did a really powerful uh, talk as part of TEDx Perth uh, in 2019, and she now runs her own doll making workshops. Uh, the Nyunga Girls Pop Fashion Project was a response uh, from the young girls wanting something space for their own. After we did a number of projects in which we mainly attracted young boys, there were hip hop projects. So a lot of the Aboriginal young boys participated in those, but the girls felt that they needed something for, you know, something a bit more specific for them. Um, so we did this 
uh, project where um, the girls were um, recycling and using the sun in their own, their own fashion. But more importantly for these young women, this project provided an opportunity to develop self-belief, gain confidence and affirm their sense of self. One of the students says, um, I was happy and more confident afterwards and I would like to do this type of workshops again. And another said, I learned that I can be a lot more confident if I just get in and try things. In the act of doing and finding their own capacities, they also found the opportunity to reflect and process grief. According to Pat Dudgeon, the opportunity to remember and to honor those who have passed away and to express grief and loss are critical factors for social and emotional well-being, which in turn impact on people's capacity to develop a positive sense of self and individual and collective sense of empowerment. So one of the young girls talks about, you know, really evoking her mother and, and, and you know, dedicating her dress to her, which was really very moving and very powerful. Um, Reclamation and affirmation was also very important to the women that I spoke to in Chile. Uh, and this, uh, so Ruby, Ruby is a theatre maker uh, that I spoke to in Santiago, and she reflects how when she was working with a group of Chilean women in the, you know, in the outskirts, in the shanty towns, how she talks about our creativity. And I love the way that Ruby, as a facilitator, talks about you know, their collective processes as our processes were unleashed. Their creativity, our creativity was unleashed. Um, it was something that had been lost with time. And she really here connects and you know, how the, the processes that were happening before and after Pinochet. So theater enabled the women to unleash the creative potential while at the same time, it became a vehicle that supported them in understanding their own histories. The connection between these two is really important um, through the theater experience that women engage in Schutz's notion of a critical conceptual of knowledge, while at the same time they were involved in the pursuit of freedom and liberation. This concept um, here from Lena and how Lena makes sense of CCD Lena is a leader in community arts and cultural development. She, she's based in Western Sydney. And she uh, says that here is definitely a vehicle to be represented and to do, to do it in your own terms, in your own voice, from your own perspective, and not to be mediated through wide lens. You're the subject, you have the power to create and do it as you want to. And that's so important because there's nothing worse than some, someone making work about you. This concept uh, is also supported by um, South African scholar Pulen Segalo, who argues that the creation of space, an opportunity for people to tell their own stories and make meaning of their life experiences, is a step to, um, towards emancipation and a, way, and a way to reduce unequal power relations that exist when people are spoken for. Art for social change methodology is based on stories. It, is a, it always begins with personal experiences of the participants and it goes beyond the individual story as the different narratives are interpreted in a variety of creative ways and in different forms. At its core, art for social change embeds collective narrative. And if there is uh, something that I'd like you to take away today is that is the key, uh, the key here is art for social change embeds collective narrative. It affords a possibility to individuals and communities who do not feel represented in mainstream narratives to communicate, affirm their stories and their lived experiences in imaginative ways, that is, those stories are mediated through art, and in doing so, art for social change creates a chance not just to tell the story, but also the opportunity to reimagine those stories, affirm authorship, claim power over one's own experiences, and uphold agency over how these stories are communicated. As a decolonial and liberation method, argue Chris Son and Amy Quayle, 
the telling of these stories is part of the process of digesting the past and its connection with the present, connecting the personal and the political and seeking healing and justice. In many cases, it is argued as being a much more effective tool than traditional kinds of community development methods. So what you see in this image is a segment of a short um, street intervention called Un Violador en tu Camino, or A Rapist in Your Past by the feminist collective Las Tesis. This uh, performance went viral in Chile in, and around the world uh, with thousands of women performing this chant uh, in many parts of the world. El patriarcado es un juez que nos juzga por nacer y nuestro castigo es la violencia que ella ves. Es femicidio, impunidad para mi asesino, es la desaparición, es la violación. Y la culpa no era mía ni dónde estaba ni cómo vestía. Y la culpa no era mía ni cómo estaba ni cómo vestía. El violador eres tú. El violador eres tú. Son los pacos, los jueces, el Estado, el presidente, el Estado opresor es un macho violado. El Estado opresor es un macho violado. El violador eres tú. Well, in October 2019, the Chilean government raised the metro fare. This hike unleashed a series of acts of civil disobedience that culminated in a massive social uprising in Santiago. And the response of the right-wing Chilean president, Sebastián Piñera, was to declare a state of emergency that echoed the Pinochet dictatorship of the 70s. So violence and repression followed. This is the context in which Las Tesis performance emerges. It connects patriarchal and systems of oppression to the rape and the violence of women, sorry, to the race and the violence of women experienced during the social uprising. Rape was used again in Chile and it emerges as a symbol of state power and as, as normalized forms of social control. So Las Tesis are for women, all involved in the performing arts. The name Las Tesis uh, means the thesis. Their aim is to connect their political performance to feminist theories and to make them accessible to women, especially to women who have not had the opportunity to access feminist literature. In this case, Las Tesis uh, name the Argentinian, uh, the Argentinian scholar Rita Segato as their inspiration for this piece. Segato is a very well-known anthropologist whose work on gender violence has positioned her as one of the leading uh, and most important decolonial feminists in Latin America. But she actually, Segato has not been translated into English, the English language yet. Segato believes that as an academic, she is a giver of words. And when the words offered by an intellectual do not resonate with people because they do not express the collective experience or name or a shared reality, they tend to fade away. Whereas when people find these uh, words useful, they pick them up and share them. Un violador en tu camino is such an example of this. Uh, in this image, uh, you see the women performing a squat this is part of the performance, right? As I sing the lyrics on the second verse, um, it's femicide, impunity from my assassin. These are known as sentadillas. Uh, there's a knee squat uh, with the hands on the back of the head. This movement represents a commonly degrading uh, torture method uh, used by the police during the recent social uprising women and young females reported that after being detained by the police, they were open forced to strip uh, naked and perform these knee squats as a way uh, for them inspecting 
whether they had weapons in their vaginas. And this was reported by the United Nations Human Rights. Now, this image is outside the national stadium um, where 10,000 women, now 10,000 women perform this chant. Uh, the symbolism of this performance cannot be underestimated. The, the national stadium was used as a torture center during the, during the Pinochet regime. La Stesi performance became a collective catharsis and without a doubt has given the feminist uh, movement in Chile power and energy. And this leads to my findings. Now, against the ongoing racialized and gendered power structures embedded in colonialism and neoliberalism in both countries in Chile and Australia, I found that these personal narratives and the stories that the women um, you know, did, really they found their voice and agency to express their own ways of knowing and, and, and to really um, express their creative resistance and for social change, um, as I was saying earlier, didn't just uh, give them the women the opportunity to tell the story, but also to reimagine those stories and affirm authorship, affirm their own power over their own experiences and how, you know, how these stories actually are expressed and communicated. There is an important threat about how women conceptualize the shift from fear to, to connect into their own personal power. And one of the um, women that I interviewed uh, talked about a particular project that she was part of. And she said that project was when the fear stopped winning. For me, that was so powerful, the symbolism when, you know, for a project, for a project um, to, to mean that for someone when the fear stopped winning, it was, it was pretty incredible. Um, now, the other thing that was really interesting is that the women's uh, connection to their own power uh, med mediated through arts and culture impacted the group dynamics. So that meant that the women, um, uh, as they were gaining power, they had a, a different relationship to the collective. Also, another woman that I interviewed uh, told me the story of the crabs that she described. She said, oh, you know, the crabs in the bucket. Uh, she said, you know, one crab needs to get out of the bucket to be able to help the other crabs. This is the way she was seeing her own power and influence with the group that she was working with. Um, the Nyunga women testimonies show a link, also a very powerful link between the development of their internal capacities and their connection to language, family, stories and cultural identity. And many of the projects that we did was really affirm uh, Nyunga language and that has, uh, had a huge impact on, on the women. Also the arts both uh, in Chile demonstrate the power to transform and sustain political movements across generations, as we see in the case of Las Tesis, you know, connecting back to, and Andre Olivares the dancer, connecting back to 30 years, you know, prior to that, what has happened during the Pinochet regimes. So when art for social change processes frame uh, the, the projects in a deliberate decolonizing framework, that is when projects find a way of grounding knowledge outside patriarchal and Eurocentric ways, then and only then we can talk about an empowering practice. And some of the characteristics of this empowering practice it's um, are all listed here. Like we, the stories must be centered in the participant experience and ways of knowing. Are they they initiated and driven. Oops, oops. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, initiated and driven from the ground up. Uh, they present alternative narratives and histories and challenge this pervasive construction of women who participate in these projects as disadvantaged. I, the number of Aboriginal women that I've spoken to, we all seek of being constructed as dis disadvantaged women. Uh, captures and makes visible cultural knowledge that has been dismissed or is being lost. Uh, it must be a collective, it's always a collective process seeks to connect theory and practice, as you see clearly in the case of last thesis. 
uh, carefully examines our own positions, values, and political beliefs. Raise internet intersectional consciousness, speak out, and build political awareness. Seeds power and decision making to those people who are the participants. But also, we have to be very careful because uh, us, you know, this this is not a panacea, and many of these projects are also uh, can be easily co uh, complicit in perpetuating systemic um, systems of oppression, and that can be also to appropriate other form of uh, racial ex uh, radical expressions um, have been like they've been in the past. It can be also depoliticized uh, by taking the stories out of context and removing women's agency that way. I'd love this um, quote also from Ruby because she sort of illustrated this point really well um, by her saying that she doesn't like to do testimonial work. Um, she doesn't like exploiting that kind of theater. Um, and, and she said, well, we only did collective stories. And, and during that process, certain themes started to emerge, like violence against women, the opportunities, but also an abandonment. And, and she says that how they work with those, with those but, but it was really important that she, the process allowed for the women to distance themselves from those experiences. And then the process was very helpful. She said they, did, they didn't need to put their lives on stage. And I've seen many of this practice where that's precisely what is done. People's experiences are put on stage. As activists and artists uh, continue to denounce the crisis in which we, we live today, we have been reminded that we're not just facing an economic recession with COVID-19 and a health emergency by the catastrophic consequences of inequality are threatening and dehumanizing our own existence. So what these social movements are highlighting, and I, I, at this point I must acknowledge obviously that the judgment last night or yesterday was incredibly important for the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and these movements are highlighting that those who have experienced multiple forms of oppression can no longer struggle in isolation. And Bell Hooks here says something that I find a quite, a really quite powerful. Um, you know, there's, it's, many of us found it was easier to name the problem and to deconstruct it. And yet it's, it was really hard to create our theories that would help us to build community, help us to board across and to truly remain connected in a space of difference long enough to be transformed. I believe art for social change can con contribute toward that space of difference that leads to transformation. After reading and writing um, about art for social change for so long, I'd like to suggest maybe a different language uh, perhaps to better reflect what is required at this moment in time and that is to work for art for social just art for social justice. And I'd like to finish with this um, quote that um, really moved me quite deeply when I heard it for the first time. That's it. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Pilar. That was um, amazing. It's amazing to hear you speak about the work. I've, I've read the thesis and every, every time I, I hear you speak it, something, something different comes up. But um, we've, got, we've got about 10, 12 minutes or so. So I'm just going to go straight over to see if people have comments, questions, reflections, reactions. And I have a glass of water. <laughs> well, you have your glass of water here. Mm. No? Sam Key says, brilliant, thank you. Hi, hi Chris. Hello. Hello. This is Priya here. Hi, Priya. Hi, Priya. Um, it was so wonderful to hear you speak, Pilar, and also because I 
have just been a watcher on your journey for the last year. Congratulations <laughs> on getting Thank to you. this point. It must be such a relief <laughs> to be where you are. But I oh. wanted to say how appropriate and relevant this work is for so many of us working in the sector here and also because we're trying to rethink the term community and community art itself and the way that you have phrased it thinking about decolonizing methodologies and bringing together global south feminist theorists to bear on local struggles and also the international question at the same time um, it's really profound. And I would say that I also commend you on looking at an auto-feminist ethnographic approach um, in thinking through some of these larger questions. And I know that we're only seeing a small slice of the much more complexity that lies in the work. I guess for uh, my only question, and perhaps you can just uh, uh, you know, talk about it as, as briefly or in as much detail as time allows is this question of how you negotiate your positionality in doing the work with First Nations artists here. Um, and how do you contextualize that with the complexity of settler colonial models in Chile, which are not the same and the history is different. It is quite distinct. And yet what is it that you can offer as a tool for those of us that come from these kind of multiple spaces where we are in different positions of power and how do we then work with um, First Nations artists? Something like, like that, it doesn't have to be um, you know, too detailed, but just a that, that was my question, only because I'm genuinely looking at these questions myself. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words as well. Uh, look, I, um, I, this is, I guess, uh, in a way, my, my desire to do this, actually this thesis was because I, I had, I, I wanted to reflect on that specific question. How, how do I um, position myself and negotiate in this particular space? And, and you're right. I mean, the, coloni the colonization of coloniality happened differently in Latin America on Abya Yala that happened here. But there are a lot of similarities too. And I think this is where um, it's important to understand that the, uh, it, only very recently actually that people have been theorizing uh, in Latin America as a colonial settler society. Uh, and, and, and the argument is we, we should have all along understood the same process. It, it is the same process, right? Racialization, the, um, the um, you know, the, the burial, the burial of those indigenous stories have been uh, quite uh, the process of coloniality has been in a way similar. So I guess first of all, understanding our own position is key, and I, I know Priya that you you you're very aware of that. Um, understanding your own position. Secondly, um, understanding that historical context and finding those threads. I mean, that, I guess that's at the end in my, in my work, what you see is these social movements are connecting across the global South. So, so looking for those political connections um, and, and where is complex, I suppose, is, is um, having a political position that may maybe not everyone shares. I mean, the assumption is, you know, oppression doesn't necessarily involve that everyone automatically will gain, um, you know, political awareness and consciousness. And I think this is this is perhaps the work that we must do. Is how can can we contribute in enabling spaces in which people are begin to connect these issues, um, like the dolls, for example when people, you know, the project, and it's, we didn't um, set ourselves to have a project to talk about the stolen generations. That was never intended. We set ourselves to do a project where women have the opportunity to work together and create a space that they can call their own. But in the process of doing that and the process of the interaction, these things started to emerge. So our role was to help the women connect some of this uh, point in history, and and uh, and um, and go at their pace, and uh, and enable those interactions to occur. 
Um, so I think that that's really, that's probably where this work needs to go. It's to, to um, enable the opening of these conversations to happen and for people to realise how they've been impacted. And also the other critical thing is to help enable the connection of these points. You know, these things are not isolated. They're not just happening to you. They're happening to a, a collective group of people. I hope that I've answered that. I'm not sure. Thanks, Pilar. Um, I want to have these dialogues. I'm going to call you and we're going to okay. talk more, but I'm going to let <laughs> yes. other people speak up now. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Maybe Priya will come and um, present at one of our dialogues. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, absolutely, happy to. Okay, excellent, we'll follow up. <clears throat> um, any other questions or comments for Pilar? Um, Chris, I've got a, a question. Liz Gab? Yeah, thanks, thanks Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Pilar. Hi. Um, I, I'm just interested in your perspective on the community arts sector more broadly mm -hmm. and and the fact that from my perspective community arts sector still has a long way to go in terms of uh, having a sense of its own colonial structures um, in terms of who runs it and how it's run who gets money who doesn't you know all of those kinds of things, and I just, I just was interested to know how you see the community arts sector more broadly. I mean, it's capable of doing these amazing kinds of transformational projects, but often not in the hands of the people in charge. Well, <laughs> what can I say? Um, again, uh, another key motivation for me um, to do this um, theoretical framing was because the, um, the people who are supposed to be receiving this practice, the beneficiaries of this practice, are in the main women, are in the main, uh, you know, women of colour, uh, First Nations women, uh, young people at disadvantage. Um, so I, I had a I had exact, pre precisely your views. I'm thinking, well, here we got a practice that is, um, it's been mainstream in some ways. And when I say mainstream to some extent, because of the resources that the practice get uh, in relation to, um, you know, high arts, it's, it's very minimal. It's, it's really, it's so minute by com in comparison. There still is a, a peripheral to the art and culture sector in Australia in the funding context. Um, so ha having said that though, it, it is, so when we go back to the history in Australia, how it's funded, yes, it was very much inspired by the in 60s and 70s by, by quite, you know, um, uh, I wouldn't say revolutionary, but certainly um, transformative movements. And yet the minute that it got, um, uh, that it was, uh, the state funding got the, the connection with the state, the agenda has progressively uh, been more, become to be more conservative, and particularly in the 1990s. I mean, we saw across the globe, I guess, with increase of neoliberal uh, thinking, that the, the, you know, the, the rhetoric of community arts practice became a uh, rhetoric about um, welfare, really. Um, you know, uh, so I think, look, I, I agree with you. I think the um, I'm hoping to make a contribution to this sector by, by challenging some of these notions and by challenging um, some of the, how the power structures within their own sector are uh, reflected. I mean, it's no longer appropriate, I think, for people who are not, that haven't got a lived experience um, to be running projects that actually attempt to help uh, these communities, it, and the power must be transferred. This is the point of seeding power. And I think communities need to demand that this power is seeded. And I guess, again, that comes back to my previous point 
uh, we, this work needs to enable people to recognize the power that they have. Um, like my, you know, one of my uh, interviewees that says that project was when the fear stopped winning. That's what we need to create more opportunities for people to re, um, rethink about their own power and how they can exercise their power in this. And the sector, uh, there are some entrenched positions. We, we know people in the sector have been there for 20, 30 years. It's time for renewal, but um, uh, yeah. Uh, um, um, let me <laughs> let me tell you that I'm hoping that some of these ideas can can you know um, enables a different kind of conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Bella. So there's more. There's lots more conversations like that to have, I think. But um, I'm just conscious of time, and I know people might have to get off. Um, if people need to leave, feel feel free to do so. We'll keep the link open for a little bit uh, longer. If Pilar is happy to stay, and we can just yes, keep, of course. Uh, yeah, just keep keep chatting. Um, so for people who have to go, that's, yeah, we'll, we'll see you another, another time, but no, otherwise we'll just keep, keep yarning for now, Pilar. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. <laughs>
is really amazing. And I, I mean, when I first wrote about coloniality of power stuff, it was, it was, it was because someone else introduced me to the language that came out of Latin America as well. So I think those sorts of things, I mean, the, the stuff that people have written in, in other languages, because we are so locked into, mm. well, I don't speak for everyone, but I think so locked into, into English. And then I think English that comes from the US um, or either from Europe. And there's other places that I have stuff in English, but the way in which the knowledge circulates, you know, the politics mm. of knowledge and the knowledge economy, I think, is part of that, that colonial sort of um, um, machinery. Um, that conditions how we, what what we can think, how we can think, but but this whole movement and I think what you've introduced also made me think about. I mean, and I think your work was more than the epistemologies. I think there were onto epistemologies that's captured in that that lived experience. And once you once mm -hmm. you actually think through those, that, that 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 there's that there's the lived experience as 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 the knowing, but but how that shifts. And I was I don't know I was talking to Rama them and, and just trying to comprehend. <clears throat> To the extent that I'm able to, when Indigenous people talk about country, that that, that actually mm -hmm. means a real shift in how you think about terms like community, um, of course, and so on, because the relationality and the relational or dialogical dimensions that sits yeah. um, and that sits within those frameworks is just so powerful. And I think we 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 sometimes we we don't we, we don't really appreciate them because they get transformed through our practices of knowledge production as well, which, which I think is like, like actually quite profound things, really. So thank you for that. I think it was, yeah, there's, so, there's so much more that you can, yeah, can thank talk you. about thank in you. terms of that. First work. time that I present uh, about my work um, after, you know, being, having been conferred as a doctor. And because thank you for the invitation. I, I've been working in this space for a very long time, but now I feel I'm hoping that, you know, I, um, it, this gives me a different level of authority to be able to speak about some of these things. And um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I do, Dr. K. for the space. Mm. All right, any other comments or questions? No, that's, that's it. All right, well, we're gonna let Pilar go because otherwise <laughs> people feel like I'm just holding him here and I don't wanna let him go. They might wanna go. <laughs> And don't forget, Pilar, Uncle Rama's in your neck of the woods at the moment. Who? <laughs> we, we haven't met before. This bloke at the bottom there. Oh, you haven't ah, met Rama. Why see, don't see, I see, I, Rama? Sorry, I can't, I can't see everybody here either. I think I only have six people in my view. Well, I don't uh, know if you really want to meet him, but I, yeah, he's outed now, oh. so. Oh, hello. <laughs> nice to meet you, Pilar. <laughs> nice to sorry, meet you. sorry that I forced him on you now, Pilar. No, that's good, that's good. <laughs> I thought you'd met him before. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he comes across as right. He'll stand out in a crowd in Perth. He dressed like someone from Melbourne. So you'll see. You'll pick, you'll pick him out. <laughs> wow. wow. I bet you're glad you got Chris to introduce you, Rama, aren't you? Yeah. That's, that's, uh... yeah. <laughs> I'll be looking for someone with style then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's Rama. Not, not, not Sam, Sam don't lie. Sam, you call him the fa our fashionista. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway all right pilar thanks a lot for that i uh, amy said she wants to read your thesis i noticed in one of these comments so that's something oh, else for her on, to load I... on to her massive Wait workload a that she's carrying <laughs> no hey amy this Ow. is it look, yeah look at this and tell her that just... you want to report back next week oh yeah <laughs> i just saw it's 350 words or so uh, pages <laughs> Oh, uh, well, she went two and a half point spacing, I think, not two. It seems like two PhDs, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> Chile and Australia. <laughs> That's <laughs> not huge. Uh, lovely to see you, Amy. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mm. All right. See you, see you all. Thanks, Rosani. Thank okay, you. Rama, catch up. Yeah. Bye. Ah, I